in the youth program camp, 90% local. We have tried to do uh, clean up paddle boards and canoe trips. They weren't that successful when the pandemic hit, but I have some ideas on reintroducing those programs to hopefully make them be, become successful. Yeah, I think I'm thinking about the visibility with SRC for mm -hmm. marketing purposes and yeah. whether or not letting uh, the tourist population know. And also just making sure that we're considering, I know Mike has talked about the fee structures in the past, but making sure that um, the people we're subsidizing are district folks right. and that we charge enough for um, tourists and that, um, and also I just think people are looking for places to get away and things for their kids to do. And I yeah. think there's an excellent opportunity to market. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, do you do, sorry, no, you're fine. Little, like, do you, um, like with 12 and homes or something, do you, would you maybe like share like programs with some of those partner type places that you could, you know, because like Portland families are always looking for camps. Yeah. And kids too, you know yeah. what I mean? I don't know. I wonder if you could like get in there and book with her. Anyway, that that'd be like down the line, but it might be a way to like bring in mm -hmm. more revenue. We talk internally, uh yeah. the department heads, but I haven't thought about yeah. actually advertising within their, their program guide or anything. Uh so on next is fitness and, and recreation. This one's run by me mostly. I do get a lot of help from uh Chris Picola stuff, especially when it comes to the pickleball. Uh, we do have about 18 to 20 participants every Monday and Thursday, and I bet if we added a Friday like we're looking to, we'll have that same number, if not more. Um, we did two sessions of Start Smart this last year, soccer and football. I ran the soccer, Chris McAllister ran the football. I, and I mean, within no time it was full, and I have all of those people on the list. And right now, when I made this last week, there was 11 registered for basketball, which isn't starting until March. So I think it's going to be a great program. We did make a couple of small changes. It was running one day a week for eight weeks, and now I'm doing it twice a week for four weeks. Uh, it seems like that kind of matches up with the local sports that they'd be doing once they jump out of the program. So I'm trying to match up with what's currently going within the community. And then on top of that, it gives me a chance to run a second session if the interest is there. Uh, 20, I realized when I did soccer at 15 in gym two, it's about as many kids you can have running around in there and still have, feel like you have some control. Uh, we did the football in the cafeteria at 18, and that was all right too, so I think 20 is about as much as we could probably take. Uh, so yeah, we did change twice a week so we can maximize our attendance. Um, we had a pickleball tournament in November. It was run by Pickleball is Great. Uh, we got a tourist grant from the city, uh, the Visitors Bureau, right? Mm -hmm. To help offset any costs with that, and there were 53 participants. It was a little bit lower than expected, um, but there wasn't a lot of advertising done. There was a little bit of problems on the contract with Pickleball is Great, but to have 53 participants come out here, and they did all tech surveys, and not one bad remark. Everyone even loved the facility. The only thing was that the floor was a little bit slippery, but we took care of that. No problem. So and working with them to do that again. So sorry to be on um, communications with my Yeah. House, so I'm asking this. Uh, um, so I'm just curious about like, how are we marketing? Like, I didn't know we were doing the drop-in to Hall, mm -hmm. which I think is fantastic and didn't mm -hmm. that many people participating. So how is one to know? That that's happening right now, and do you think that's something, an area for potential growth for us Absolutely. to figure out how to market that? Okay. Yeah, there's a ton of growth in pickleball right now. I meant marketing in general. Oh, like, yeah, I, I think people. there is, yeah. I think so. When the pandemic hit, I think we really pulled back a lot of our marketing, and I think we're just slowly reintroducing that. Okay. A lot of this stuff is word of mouth right now, things that get out. You see it on the Facebook page. Yeah, right? we push a lot on Facebook, and then I did. The pickleball is in the program, right? So the program and then on the newsletter. Yeah, it's in the monthly, the monthly newsletter. newsletter. And then we, we tried uh, with that one. It was, it was easy because we have good connections with uh, some people uh, yeah. that are engaged in that community, right? And so we just shared, hey, you're going to have this opportunity available to you. And we knew that uh, we were only going to be able to accommodate you know, about you know, 18 or so total people every day just because we only have three 
purchase three nets. Okay. We only really wanted to have one gym kind of set aside for pickleball a day so that our youth programs could use the other uh, gym during that time. But I think now it's just uh, up to us. We kind of need to find the right model to sort of expand the program and maybe provide it three or four times a week or even you know, going to uh, a, a daily yeah. opportunity. That'll, that'll be down the road. Yeah. And so, given all of these activities right now, so what percentage, like, I mean, I'm seeing the gym being used a lot already mm -hmm. in just what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, what percentage of the hours that are available while we're open are we using as like, a gym ball? So they use, they use um, that's a tough question. Yeah, it is tough. I would say, I mean, probably okay, yeah. upwards of 75, 80 percent. Right yeah. now, because we have so much basketball in there, yeah. I mean, it's, it starts, basketball teams are in there at like 4 o'clock every day till 8.30. Okay. And then we have our youth programs using at least one of the teams. On and off all day, yeah. yeah. The, the quiet time is uh, 1 to 3, half time. And you're using both yeah. gyms for those activities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we can't commingle the no, preschool yeah. classrooms oh, and the after school program kids, so sometimes they are using both gyms. And then we have to come all the in the morning, we still have you know some other folks that are renting the gym, you know, for other purposes. We have PBL tournaments wow. in there in the weekends. So. And are we using the cafeteria space for any activities like this? Yeah, we have. We used the football, the side smart football, because it was at the same time as PBL practices. They had to use the cafeteria. Wow. Okay. We looked into using the Hirsch hitting facility. Uh -huh. The space is great, but the setup and tear down every day would have just been too much work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the current fitness classes, they are dress exercise, is that the water or the land one? Land? They do it here. Jen does it oh, over here. Okay. Yeah. yeah, these are all currently the land versions. Okay. I haven't added in the aquatic ones. <clears throat> I just like to mention yeah. uh, on the marketing thing, I saw a subtle thing going on. I like to watch the Australian Open. I like to watch professional tennis quite a bit. And I noticed that outside the stadium in Australia, that they panned in and they've got people playing pickleball outside <laughs> right there at the tennis venue. Pickleball is massive, right? But that's now. a very subtle marketing. Yeah. To, to show that, yeah. they're very vigorous and active. Yeah. Uh, Justin, yeah. do you, I, I had to like miss the workshop when we talked about like strategy, but um, do you guys think that we would have it in the budget eventually to look at the floors? Because they are getting a lot of use. And just for like safety, I'm, I'm assuming we might have to think about that too. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to. I yeah. haven't had those conversations at all. I mean, yeah. I did talk to Scala one day when I was talking yeah. about sleep balls. <laughs> and yeah, we, we have some plans to hopefully redo those one day. Yeah. Uh, the other thing to add to this page uh, is we're trying to add in an evening class. These right now currently are all day time. Uh, we started, a, we tried to do a four o'clock class and it just didn't go. So we canceled that one. We decided to do a survey. I just got the results this morning. 80 people took it, and it's super positive. They're looking for 5 to 6 or 6 to 7 p.m. So I just onboarded a new instructor named Kathleen. She's a certified yoga instructor. She can teach numerous classes. We're onboarding her now, and hopefully next month we can start adding that class in. So. Um, I'm curious also, yeah. this maybe have not, have not been discussed yet, but one of the things that was brought up by the um, the presentations by SFA last time was the idea that of uh, having some sort of mix of classes run by staff of the district, um, but also where we might just be a space provider. Yeah. Like having private less you know lessons taught by somebody else that that were sort of a way for them to connect with the public and have people sign up and then yeah. we provide space. Have you had anybody? Any instructors inquire about that, or that have there been any discussions? Not yet, uh, but Living Fit is one that we partner with right now. Okay. They run their own studio. Uh, it's on 101, right? Yeah. Uh, south on 101, and our pass holders can go there right now. What they're doing just Zoom, but they do do in person. But that is the potential to do something like that. Okay. Absolutely. I think that if you think about her business and her rent down there. Probably be cheaper for her if we could rent a space at the SRC and offer some programming to our participants. So, yeah, definitely, I do see the potential for that to become reality. Uh, I think that's this page. Yeah. 
move on to special events. So in the past year, this is run by Melissa Usley. Uh, she will probably be here at some point popping in. Um, but she runs this department, the special events department, and she only has one staff member in New World who mostly just helps out with uh, the department. So besides that, pretty much all the jobs are done by Melissa, so she's an absolute rock star. A couple of events that have returned were this year was the Turkey Trot, which saw over 200 people show up on the day. Uh, we have the Four Fun Fest, which was the first big event I think we did in the SRC, which was huge, it was awesome. And then the, the egg hunt, which was back to in person, uh, as opposed to last year, handing out the eggs and doing it virtually. And all three of those were great and were well attended. And I think they're on their way back to those pre-pandemic levels if we can keep moving in this direction. A couple of added events last year was the 100K Relay and the Chalk Art Contest, which we are going to try to keep this year and see if we can grow those programs. Uh, I know with the 100K Relay, I thought that was really fun. And as we were there that night, we were approached by a lot of people that were like, oh, we would have loved to have done something like this. And there was also actually a middle school group that ran in the event, and it really made me think, man, we really need to challenge the, the school district to compete in some of these, and maybe even against the teachers, against some of our staff, you know. So I was really excited about that 100K Relay, and looking forward to seeing if we can continue to grow that this year. Uh, I was going to speak about the revamp sponsorship levels, but I noticed it's on the agenda, so we could just skip through that. That's something Melissa and I really worked hard on to get this going this year to try to get some better commitments from the community and, and get these events squared away a little bit easier. Um, we run Break the Chain every year. Break the Chain is an organization to fight childhood trafficking. sex trafficking, right. But over the last few years, we don't get a lot of support from the organization. And it's really difficult to send a message out when you don't have the organization help. No materials, nothing. The first year we did, then it just kind of died off at that point. So what Melissa and I thought to do was to just do, uh, instead of doing Break the Chain, uh, we could do Run for Change or something like that and just pick local organizations to benefit each year. Because I really think that if you have an organization's backing, it's going to help us get the word out to grow the event to get more people involved. Another thing we thought about was maybe moving it off the prom and off the beach because it seems like that's where we do all of our runs and maybe that could help grow the event also. So we're going to put out maybe uh, for people to bid on each year or two years or three years worth of the event or something like that. We haven't landed on that one just yet, but it's, it's in the works to do a little bit of change on that. Open to ideas if anyone has any. And then the last thing is just the farmer's market that had an average of 800 vis visitors each week last year, which is amazing, and it was just really fun to, to have everyone out there and see all the animals. <laughs> also, <laughs> I don't know if we counted those visitors. Right, and then your program. So your program is run by Erin Redding. I know you guys seen her, I think, in November, maybe? and got a good um, overview. So we moved youth from the youth center to the SRC on the week of spring break. It was an awesome move, um, but everyone knows how moving goes, so we don't want to do that again. Uh, in the summer camp, we had 50 kids each day, uh, and in right now in preschool and after school, if you combine the numbers, we have 50 right now. The department has nine employees, and that includes Aaron. I would say that's two to three short right now, and I would love to expand the program so maybe five, sure. <laughs> so, and then what we're looking to do is figure out what our next implementation is. Uh, Aaron and I had a meeting this morning, and we're thinking that this toddler care might be the first, the next step, and then maybe infant care. Uh, I know that Zoe has a lot of passion to bring the middle school program back in some way. I have some hesitations just with the proximity of the school now. So I'm just not sure if that one will, will work out, but we'll look into that a little deeper. Those specialist camps that have already been brought up a few times, like uh, music camp, we have the um, performing arts room now, so it's like the ideal space. Um, we were looking to maybe bring back part-time preschool. That was one of the ones that we were thinking of with these three, what would be the next natural step. What I mean by part-time preschool would be either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday only. 
as opposed to five days a week up till 1 p.m. And then the CIT program is the counselor and training program, which I think Erin also spoke about, that we're looking to bring on, because we really need to find a way from when they finish the program to help also feed the program. You know, these kids that are in the program would be ideal candidates to help run it when they're old enough. So we're really trying to find a way to bridge that gap into staffing the program. Do you, can I ask, where do you have, where's the greatest call from the community? Like, what, where's your waiting list for the current program? The one right now is um, after school. Uh, we do have a few on preschool, but they're not serious. And we bring them in when we can because we actually have a couple of slots open. In the preschool you have open? Yeah. Uh, and I would say in talking to the community, that toddler and infant care would be number one. I actually had Jeffy Parker come by today and I told him, yeah, we're looking into it. And in his eyes light up. He actually made the comment to me one day, if you had that kind of care, I would work for the district this time. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> and so yeah, that, that's where my head is at right now, that public and infant care is almost non-existent around. Uh, preschool is also a dire need, but I don't think it's as, as, as dire as what, what's first thought of. I think the pandemic might have changed that need also. I feel like uh, preschool was those part-time rooms. So probably from stay-at-home parents that are just like, I don't need the expense right now. Um, how, for the staff, you said you're looking, you need to get some additional staff. And I'm just curious about how our staff retention is there. I know that schools are really struggling, um, teachers and such, and so I'm wondering how that translates for the district and yeah. maintaining staff in the system. Yeah, right now our staff are working more than any of them would love to work, but they all love their job. We have that great core group right now that just needs to expand. Uh, we have our two lead teachers have been with the district for years. Uh, Zoe's you know, been with the district for longer than most. I think she hired Darren. <laughs> <laughs> even buy an application in youth programs right now. We typically run the after school with high school, at least two or three high schoolers, and there's not even high school students working in youth programs right now. Do you, um, what do you feel like would be the, what is the barrier to attracting clientele? I wish I knew. Um, we had a no-show. The last three interviews have just not shown up. Yep. We had two of them halfway through paperwork and then just stopped coming. No communication. So I, I just can't figure it out. Yeah, I think, uh, you look at um, talking to Aaron about this a few days ago. We have a number of youth program staff that don't live here. They live. Uh, we have some that live in one that lives in Tina Beach or out like a Hamlet Route area. We have down twenty six. We have one out towards Jewel. We have one that lives in like Clapskenai or Rainier. So that like the cost of community. It is. is that well, it's the, the, the cost of living here. You know, I think folks want to work here. <laughs> Uh, and then see the opportunity working for us, but um, not, not available housing or, you know, it's just yeah. the, the fact of our community. And then I think the other thing that might um, potentially be hurting us from, uh, we haven't, like Justin said, we haven't lost candidates or we haven't lost our employees as much as you might think, but um, we're competing with the school district. Uh, you know, they almost always have teacher aid positions available, and those are benefited positions. They're not, typically they're not as well compensated as our positions, but they're full-time and they're benefited. Mm -hmm. And that's um, a difficult, and that's a difficult uh, barrier for, for someone to choose, you know, employment with us. They, they really must want to work, you know, with the preschool population, or they don't want full-time employment, because if you want to work, then you're probably going to take the full-time and benefited position. Yeah. And do we, is like one of the benefits we offer is child care for those folks that work? We don't, and it's it's a great suggestion, but we're technically, um, uh, we're strongly discouraged from doing that, from providing our employees any, any access to programs and services that we don't provide the public. So there's no benefits that we can offer to our employees, um, you know, free, free child care or, or at early enrollment or anything like that because, um, not, it's not legal in the state's eyes. Yeah. What's that? I just said public health. Yeah. yeah. Government can't benefit. <coughs> yeah. 
Oh, but don't wow. we offer it to other city and governmental folks? I thought we offered discounted. We we do, but not not like access to programs or services. So and and, and that discount is I mean it's it's like uh, a ten percent discount on the membership. So oh, employees have like a membership discount potentially, potentially, but they don't have they can't apply that benefit or that percentage discount to youth programs or to enrollment oh. in camp or preschool. Okay. It's only for like a general membership. That would be amazing to that off of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, something that just that has been asked about is a babysitting course. Plus, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of changes through Red Cross recently, and I'm trying to wrap my head around the CCR change right now. Uh, so with that change, I should have put this in the inquiry update. Uh, with that change, uh, it's seen a few of us. I was an LGI, so lifeguard instructor, to be able to teach that same class. Um, but because of where we live, every two years we have to pay someone to come out to update the cert, uh, and this year was just extremely difficult uh, so we actually had Megan and Lindsay the only ones that updated but they're uh, into the IT Academy to be able to be trainers that's the highest level so we would be able to be self-sustainable if that course goes through they applied we put recommendation letters and they got accepted and everything but they said don't book a hotel yet just in case so uh, I think it's in April or March or April uh, it's a week-long course and that would be able to redevelop and add in a babysitting class because I do see a lot of value in a babysitting class yeah. for sure. Skylar, sorry, what if you did like a, sorry I'm going back to the, no, no, go ahead. the like a child care voucher that was compensation and then they apply that voucher, they apply that compensation to whatever child care program they decide. Like make it, like make it a taxable benefit. Yeah, a taxable benefit. So a fine suggestion. <laughs> I wish I was uh, smart enough to say yeah that would work within the Within what uh, the state as well as we can do. But I mean, I think if you're applying it as just compensation, yeah. taxable, then they can do whatever they want with that money. Yeah. I don't know. So look into that. I would work with you if you want to help. We could support that. Yeah. Maybe looking into that. Um, because you would probably then have moms who would be interested in, right? Like a, something like this. Sure. Yeah, no, that's the barrier. Like, yeah. I'm going right. to pay to put my, my kids in there and then work and it's a wash at best. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we did only, there's only been one in Canada since I've been working over youth programs that decided not to go forward with the interview because it would be a wash for pay. Yeah, exactly. Families yeah. feel that way. Yeah. So I, I have an, I had an incident in my own life many, many years ago where because of my injuries I had to be put into, um, you know, like attending classes for like how to go to an interview and I'm like no my job's waiting for me but the point is what I've been hearing a lot of is kids you know youth don't show up or young adults don't show up for the interview mm -hmm. and it's like they're they need to understand you know the rules of this you know my favorite word decorum <laughs> and I, I wonder if we need to offer that kind of class you know like you show up dress nicely, you show up on time, yeah. you know, if you can't come because of some legitimate reason, you are calling in to say, hey, this is what, you know, because life happens. Yeah. But, you know, I I guess I've been hearing enough about it that maybe the, you know, when you're looking at it, considering a babysitting class, it's also, you know, a basic how to interview, yeah. how to be a, you know, an employee. Yeah. I think part of the problem is that there's so many job openings in so many fields. They can pretty much pick and choose. So maybe they go out and start the process with five or six, and yeah. then they, you know, get the call back from five or six, and they pick the first one that pays the most. Well, yeah. I, I know more about the five types of that people weren't showing up. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was. It, it just seems like, and I, I remember when when she was a whole lot younger, you know, people talking about, I won't even hire somebody who walks in in jeans. They need to come in looking dressed, you know, a certain way. And if I see holes in the jeans and that kind of thing, I, I've got an opinion because they're going to be standing here representing my company as I, as we sell products to the community. Right. And, you know, just, you know, some awareness of what, you know, that might be, an opportunity when we look at 
adding classes, something like that. Yeah, I think it could live in the that middle school program that Zoe keeps, you know, wanting to bring back. I think that would be a perfect addition. I'm, I'm wondering for infant, toddler, and preschool kinds of level classes. Like yeah. you've, you've talked about extended hours. I hear that a lot from folks in the community about needing, especially for our workforce. Um, yeah, the I, kind of workforce we have right now, uh, you could pick up as late as 5:45. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking more like to a weekend, 10 or. 12. 10 or 11 at night, like like or really extended hours for our tourism economy for people that are working in restaurants. Yeah, I would definitely be open to that. Uh, the preschool drop off is we have staff here at 715, yeah. um, and that's just happened because of requests. We would 8 830 before, I see. Yeah. So, yeah, if people put in requests, yeah, we could right definitely so. look at yeah. it. But yeah, the, the late nights would be difficult, I think, just with the current status of the building. But as we open more parts, I definitely right. think that would be. I think, I think just to add on to that, another, uh, we know that that's probably a, a direction that we're going to go at some point. Another barrier that we'll have to kind of figure out is right now, like, we try really hard to sort of message our preschool and market it as, as being really a, a curriculum environment, right, where there's enrichment programs and stuff. It's not, it's not just a drop-off, a, a babysitter. Um, yeah. There's, uh, there's, you know, there's some elements of the program that are, that are, different and, and really um, designed, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of figuring out, okay, so if we're going to have those kind of services, are they in the same physical spaces? Is it with the same staff? Is it a different yeah. staff group? What's the, the pricing model? You know, and all those types of questions. That's something that we just haven't really quite... Down on, yeah. yeah. I, think it's, I, I think it's worth looking at, and I think particularly as we come out of this pandemic, kids and young people are just craving connections. Yeah. and. I agree with the idea of pursuing a curriculum for preschool and also having space where kids can just be kids to play yeah. and um, and that our parents can get some relief um, or get to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will just add that my original daycare needs were from 10.30 p.m. until 1.30 a.m. when we were working. And it, it was a nightmare to find that. Yeah, and think, you know, there's some pretty <coughs> crazy circumstances that all allow us to yeah. fix that. Well, I think for our community from an equity standpoint, I think it's just really important for us to consider because the sort of business hours tend to be folks in our community that are, you know, white collar workers um, yeah. who are maintaining regular office hours. And that's not the majority of our community. And so I think if particularly for our youth parents if we're able to provide some services um, to the families that have needs that aren't working the nine to five jobs that are working some of the blue collar. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. And it honestly hasn't been something that I've thought too hard about, but we could definitely look into the possibility of something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to move on and I'm glad Chris is here. You may have questions that you could just directly answer. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the senior meal side is another area that I oversee that that, that Chris does all the work for. <laughs> so he he does a great job. Like he said, they said earlier, they the 19,000 combined between meals on wheels and curbside, uh, thousand pounds of fresh produce in fruits and vegetables. 2,500 hours of volunteers, would you say 20 to 25 volunteers that you work with right now? Yeah. And yes, yeah, since the start down in 2020, the hall has been closed, uh, but more than 12,000 meals have been served curbside. Mm -hmm. I know we've almost got to the point of reopen. Yeah. We had it, Chris put a lot of work into our plans, uh, but then was it just Omicron that kind of shut it down, right? No, Delta. Delta, Delta, that's right. Delta, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's no replans to open right now, but with the way Chris runs it, he's got it running perfect. Couldn't so ask for more. I do have a question. Yeah. I, I'm seeing this question today. So I'm just curious. I'm seeing that our service area is um, Cannon Beach to Surf Point. And so mm -hmm. I'm recognizing that a couple of those communities are not in district. Um, right. and particularly for the pandemic, I think it's urgent and that we're all trying to serve people in need. But I'm just curious about serving folks that are out of district and, you know, so that, in other words, our in-district folks are subsidizing with their tax dollars. Those to some very well-off um, communities. 
Oh, no. Or does it, or go ahead, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we, do we have other dollars that we're asking? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. So, so this program is uh, is run uh, specifically by Northwest Senior Disability Services. Okay. Thank so, you. Um, <laughs> so through uh, so the money actually comes from um, the American uh, the Aging Americans Act that is funneled down to the state. So, uh, actually, uh, Chris's wages are paid to us by Northwest uh, Senior and Disability Services. Uh, we simply hold the contract and manage the meal site. Okay. Um, all the meals, uh, that meal contract is still held by Northwest Senior Disability Services. So they pay, they basically pay for the entire, the entire program. So it's, um, the geographical areas are actually defined by Northwest Senior Disability Services. So it's not, it's not coming really so much out of our pockets right. to, uh, per se. Uh, to, to really run and manage the program. So it kind of, it falls outside of that resident, non-resident structure that the, that the district has uh, being a, an actual statewide program. So that's, that's super helpful. And so yeah. will that, is that funding due to change post-pandemic or is it's it every two years? Yeah. We had it in place pre-pandemic. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So it's up, it's up, I believe, this fall uh, at the United States Congress. Okay. And because midterms always, you know, every two years, it's it's a real tough vote against. I mean, it's right. been renewed since 1966, yeah. so that's it's it's a long running program. Yeah. But uh, we, at, at a more local level, we have an opportunity to negotiate the contract with Northwest I mean, We've done that the last couple of years and yeah. asked for a, a modest increase just to cover rising costs of labor and yeah. uh, Chris's wages, but also the other. Elements associated with the program. Okay, we just voted on that recently. Yeah, we thought it was in July, but yeah. We try to bring it to you. Uh, 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 Highland versus like the two years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Chris is right. The, the, the funding comes from yeah the, the federal government, and hopefully that continues. Yeah, and if I can add, th th also there's also offset costs here locally through donations. Uh, we're, I mean, we're not fundraisers, we're here to get a meal, but um, the state recommends $3 a meal. Okay. What we find is if it's a home-delivered client more recently, they've been, that's about $75 a month. And we're, we're getting that from more clients than we used to, yeah. especially during the pandemic. Okay. People have been very thankful of the volunteers from this community yeah. taking their time and hand-delivering a meal, having some limited social interaction and just be that kind of base, that anchor for the day. Great. So that's been helpful. Thanks, Mark. And then the last part is the arts and senior programming. This one is done by me technically, but also Darren. <laughs> <laughs> because of the proximity of where I work and where Dan works, he's done a great job in really continuing to push this program and help me along the way. A couple of changes we did was it used to be run by an employee and now it's run by volunteers. So we have a couple of key volunteers that are experts in this and they, they do a great job and it's really reduced our cost in the program. We average about eight students a month and they do tend to take some of their pottery items to the farmer's market and put a little tent up and sell them. They're really successful actually. I think, can I just say too, I think that particular piece there may be opportunities for the same piece where people from, I mean, mm -hmm. like to teach in our class, or I, I think they're leading on the trails and the art association has artists. I just can imagine if they have the space and some support in, you know, pulling yeah. people in for the classes <coughs> that we have local. In fact, Seaside, I think most of the coastal communities have a art center where they have artists teaching classes and doing different things. Yeah. I think Seaside is actually one of the only coastal communities that does that. Yeah, it is something we've been talking a lot about with the SRC. We've identified a couple of rooms as potentials. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk from the art community to want to get something going. So it's definitely on the, on the horizon, for sure. Awesome. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. If you have any additional <laughs> questions, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving right along, old business.
Skylar, Brad Wakefield. Okay, so this is probably about the 70th time I think that Broadway Field or the IGA for Broadway Field has been on the SMPRD board agenda. Uh, I wish that at some point it would be not a topic of concern, but um, I know why it is and I um, am appreciative of uh, the need to discuss it and get some direction from the board, also keep you updated. So there's a few kind of different dynamics here that have to be considered. One is that the field, um, just due to mostly general wear and tear, there's a few areas that need some improvement. There's about um, at least four. Um, they have to do with uh, where the softball and the baseball teams have you know, uh, highly trafficked areas. So on the pitching circle and softball, batter's boxes and softball and baseball and the pitching mound and baseball. So uh, you know, one of the results of our location and the pandemic and this type of work being really hard to, to find help with, uh, we haven't really been able to contract that with somebody. There was a hope that we would be able to find a contractor to come out and make some of these repairs that hasn't that hasn't developed. Not and it's not because of effort. Because I know me personally, I've uh, you know called people and harassed them as much as possible. I know Levi has, and I know the school district has exhausted some of their contacts. So uh, luckily, we've been blessed with some pretty good weather, and that will enable our staff to maybe make some of the repairs. They're probably not going to be permanent type repairs, but they're going to be enough to get uh, through the next season or two. Um, one of the other dynamics of this is sort of, we were sort of waiting on the school district to kind of determine how they were going to proceed with handling their, their Title IX complaints that they received from the Office of Civil Rights, I think is OCR. And um, it's my understanding, I guess, that they've kind of got some direction and the direction that they're wanting to head. Uh, there will be some more movement here in the next little bit, but it does seem very likely, or at least possible, that the school district won't be using Broadway Field for softball um, in the next couple of years, as uh, they might be relocating the softball field to a different, a different location. And I'm not sure exactly what that means for us. But well, it probably doesn't take away from the youth programming. It probably oh, sorry doesn't. So just the height, like the high school kids may not be using it, but the youth right. would be. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think our, our plan would still be to, I mean, why why relocate a right. big softball field if we don't need to? So continue to use it for that. I think two fields is better than one. Yeah. I also don't know what it means. At, at one point in the conversation of uh, a new softball field, is they had talked about contracting with the district to help maintain that field since we have the turf knowledge and the turf equipment to do that. Yeah. But it would obviously not be at Broadway Field. It would be somewhere else. And I think the location that seems like, from what I've heard, they've settled on is uh, up at Wahana Field, where those two softball, I think they're just softball, but softball baseball fields are right now. I don't have all the details on that, but what I will share is that I think we have a good and willing partner with the school district. I think they've been supportive, I've met with the superintendent, with other staff up there. They've been responsive to our needs. And I'll also share that um, they recognize that we do need to renegotiate the IGA that governs the field, and they're willing to do that. Um, I wish I could see. I wish I could say that the city has shown a desire to renegotiate. At this point, the city hasn't really indicated that that's a priority for them, or made uh, time in our conversations for that. And so uh, it's kind of essential that we have all three, three of us working uh, in tandem. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of the way the way it's gone. Do you think that might be something that when we get the new scheme manager on board, isn't that sometime in fairly near future? Yeah, uh, I believe that they're hopeful that they'll have a new city manager by the end of the fiscal year. And um, I guess, uh, you know, it would depend on who they who they hire, I guess, and their, their priorities. I, I do think, I mean, uh, they're just, they're really busy. I don't, I don't want to make it seem like they're ignoring us. But uh, I don't think it's a, it's as high a, it's a high priority for us. It's a lower priority for them. Right? It's, it's not a one thing I had talked to the scholar about is maybe just updating the IGA himself yeah. and just saying I've updated it. Are you happy to proceed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just you know, call and yeah. Is there a reason why it shouldn't have Mark's signature versus whoever the new guy is? No, actually, I think um, it's, it has been previously signed by uh, the mayor, so it could it could go to the mayor. I don't think it has to be signed by Mark, but yeah. um, if you know, uh, 
uh, how to explain this really wish we were in um, a different setting, but um, the city has a process for how they like to do these kind of discussions and agreements, and um, I think I'm willing to step aside from that tradition, uh, but I, I want to be I want to be mindful of their their process because I think if we step too far away from what their tradition has been, then there's going to be a strong likelihood that it would be just flat out ignored as a request from us, right? Whereas if, if we can kind of find a way to sort of navigate that conversation, maybe it's saying, hey, here's what we want. All you got to do is tell us what you don't approve of, and let's yeah, like a draft. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah draft. let's move this along. So yeah. I think I think that's something. a great suggestion and something that we can move forward on. I think um, whatever we do will probably be temporary because once the field is is done and softball, the high school softball program relocates, then I think there's a, another conversation about uh, the replacement of the field and how the field is going to work and whatever happens with a different field. Yeah. There's a lot of the co the coaches went a lot of the coaches when the community went to the city council meeting last night because there's there's um, a lot of concern about getting rid of those fields at Mahana as they are and and also if they were to build a Mahana that would mean like a whole season of no access to fields and, and we don't we don't have that luxury in the community right now there's no fields yeah. for kids so I think they just wanted to make sure that the North 40, you know, that the city understands how important that is, and Mohana. I guess what I don't truly understand about the Mohana situation is it doesn't seem like they've budgeted out the cost of what they're actually trying to do, and I I still don't quite understand why we don't just extend a home plate at Broadway Field. Yeah. I, I just don't understand why they're not looking into that. But, sorry, I mean, that's not something you can oh, yeah. I mean, answer. I, I it just, it just doesn't make sense to me. I've offered that to, you know, the contractor that they're working with and to the staff up there uh, with the school district, and I'm not sure um, exactly the reason why, but I do think there might still be a solution at Broadway Field for, uh, that might be economically more feasible to yeah. uh, to, to all, all, all parties and, and keep Keep the field there where they already have uh, the, the infrastructure and the batting facility and the lights and things that would need to be replicated at whatever site they chose. Yeah. Is there a date that, that has they to be have the the SAA the the flying authority <laughs> have to approve oh. that because of the helicopter oh, that comes oh. into the hospital because oh. yeah. they're going to have to put lights there and I don't know that that actually could get approved to a yeah. So they have, uh, from what I understand as far as the timeline, they have to have uh, a plan in writing and approved by the OCR by the end of this calendar year. And then they have, I think, about a year or 18 months after that to have it, the work basically completed. Whatever solution is found and, and complied with, then they have a period of time after that. So it's a pretty, it is a pretty aggressive timeline. I think they're planning on having the field open in June. 2023, yeah. I think, at the end of the softball season next year. So that's their goal. I, I recognize that um, you have done uh, a lot of your due diligence to work with city with the administrators for each of the entities. Is there a reason just to ensure that we have the governing bodies on board and in the loop with these decisions, that there wouldn't be like a work group composed of, say, two members of this body, two members of the school board body, and two members of the city. Sure. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah. Um, I feel again. like it needs to move along. Like, yeah. yeah. And you're trying hard. You know, I, I've seen you trying really hard, and it, it feels like it just needs to move along in the conversation. Yeah. So would, would that be on the same? Yeah. Would but, that be something that a board request, a decision board request to both of those governing bodies directly? Sure. With I mean, I, I honestly think we have the context and yeah. connections with the school board. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't exactly know how it would work with, with the council, if, if, you know, if, if this is one of their priorities or if it just... Well, but they have ad hoc, they have other work groups. I, I'm aware of other work groups that they have, and it seems to me that they have different members who are interested in different areas. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I mean, think reaching out to the 
the mayor? Well, honestly, I think if, if the request came from the board okay. and we could find one or two people <coughs> of the of the council that wanted to serve in that way, and maybe talk to the school board and see, I, I know there's a couple that seem like mm -hmm. they would probably want to be involved and yeah, yeah. choose a couple from this group. I would be happy with convening that group and providing background and stuff. Uh, I'm not, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of struggling uh, with which, which, which button to push and how to push it effectively yeah. right now. Okay. I feel like I'm just I mean, you know, I'm happy to my head against the wall. assist with that yeah. initial letter, although I think it should probably be taken from the chair. Okay. Um, but I would nominate hey. Eric to be a representative of our group, so at least one of the representatives of our group. Yeah. And I do think, um, you know this, but uh, timing is, 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 I mean, we've been talking about this for years. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're under a crunch, and um, I hope that. Uh, we can kind of be back. Yeah, if, if this is going to work up there, well, Hunter, we can do it for cheaper. Exactly. Um, I think it's uh, yeah. The other the other consideration, and I think I shared this with you all before, but I mean the field is has a shelf life that is it's near the end of its term, right? It's, it's yeah. maybe got we can maybe stretch it a couple of years, two three years, but at some point it's going to need to be replaced, and so packaging maybe. Um, some changes exactly. to the softball portion of the field with a complete field replacement and starting fresh, knowing now that we cannot in any way have metal cleats on there and some of the other changes that we know will help prolong the field. I think would be really would be really awesome, but that that decision is kind of out of our hands, especially since it's not our lane and we don't really have the funds to cough up for replacement on our own, especially. Yeah, well, I say we draft something and send it, but kind of in the interim, the only thing I'm worried about is because we're like a month away from the right. season starting. Yep. Is are they actually compensating for the the yeah? So and uh, are they compensating staff too? Yeah. So okay. the school district agreed uh, mm -hmm. if we were going to do the repairs, or if we were going to find a contractor to do them, that they would pay for those repairs. And staff time though, uh -huh. or are they going to? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yep. And so uh, we buy. Is you know, he's kind of trying to figure out the construction process, and he's sort of been on hold because of weather. But also, we thought we had a contractor maybe that was going to come, and now it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. So, anyways, okay, it's kind of been a, a bit of a saga. Yeah. Well, and that's why it was one of the reasons I was asking about, about your maintenance stuff, and I wonder like if there's even temp agencies in Portland that could just help put some manpower to the trip that people might come down to do. I don't know. Yep. I think that's yeah. Is it specialized labor? I mean, I, I, I guess know. that's what I would want. Some to of it definitely is, but there's an element that's that's probably general labor that could be. I wonder, yeah, you know, the maintenance some patients could just send yeah. people help. You need to do it right. Yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, I mean none of the draft a letter, and I'm happy to put my name on it. Mm -hmm. None of the be like ask for volunteers, right? What do you mean? It's, it's too, it's too specialized in whatever, you know, construction work. You yeah, need. I mean, I think I think volunteers could potentially help. There's some liability that would carry with that. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's not fun labor. It's it's, it's difficult, and um, I would worry that we would. I want to put people that can succeed and will not hinder our maintenance staff's ability. You know, if they do more like teaching, them. teaching and, and redoing after, then um, it's probably not as effective. All right. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Obviously, more more to come. Yeah. Strategic planning. Great. Uh, okay. Well, um, happy Australia Day. <laughs> also, <laughs> the one year anniversary. This is exactly one year from when we signed the papers to close on the Census oh, Operations oh, Center. Nice. So kind of fortuitous. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really, um, honestly, I, I I know there's there's been a lot of learning that we've had. There's been some like tough moments, but the building is doing awesome. Right, and, and um, I'm really happy uh, with it. Every time I walk through, there's a really positive energy there. Um, if you've been there, especially at night when there's you know two or three basketball teams using it, PBL tournaments have used it, pickleball lover, uh, is loving it. Um, we've done a lot of cleaning and, and maintenance, so I think it's it's just been really great. So last month we had our workshop. And I just really quick, I just I was sitting there at like a basketball tournament a couple weekends ago and like a Portland parent came in and he was like, 
Now this is a gym. <laughs> he's like, this is old school. Like it's not like he was super excited, you know, when he saw it. Which gym was he in? The old gym. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> okay. Um, we had our uh, meeting last month, and we had uh, you know our presenters virtually here, and that was I think it was really awesome. I really I thought they did a great job presenting the draft. So where we're kind of at with that process is they're sort of waiting on us, and I asked them to wait until after this meeting so I could get the board's feedback on how comfortable they were with proceeding. Basically, once we give them the green light, uh, they're going to um, be able to produce the final for us in a matter of a couple weeks. Um, I've gotten some staff feedback with the draft, and I think that uh, some of the things, most of the things that the staff provided were really important, and I'm going to pass that along to Susie and Evan, and also uh, Sid. Uh, but I wanted to get your staff and ask, or your, your staff, your feedback, and ask you, you know, are you comfortable with us proceeding? Obviously, the final draft, it's not, you know, it's not what we're bound by, but I think it's going to provide a really great template for us to move forward and be something that is going to be, needs to be shared and be very visible to our constituents so that they can see this is the due diligence that we've done and this is what we're perhaps going to use to, to maybe, you know, form some of our, our next series of, of moves on. In addition to this is, you know, some conversations, I think Sid talked about this a little bit, but he's kind of preparing, uh, you know, a, a several phase approach to improving the building and saying, well, you know, this is maybe, I don't know if he's going to say phase one, phase two, but maybe he'll say these are some phases that you would could consider. So maybe it's improving this group of classrooms or this space, or maybe it's doing the exterior thing that he's talked about. Uh, but that will kind of come as part of this, the final version. And then, you know, it'll be up to us to figure out okay, how we're going to fund it, what's the timeline for doing it, maybe with that. At that point, we you know think about kickstarting kind of a fundraising campaign, a capital improvement campaign, some of those other discussions that we've had internally. But essentially, what I'm looking for in this conversation, and if you haven't had a chance to review, I can hold them off for a little bit longer. It's just getting back to them, but uh, I think we need to get back to them and hopefully conclude their work and finish out our contract with them. If we want to use them for additional services moving forward, I think. They'd be open to that. They've really loved working on the project. And actually, uh, Sid and David from Clash Group and a number of other folks were out in the building a couple weeks ago to talk about the occupancy, but also kind of it's all sort of blending together as part of this. So I know, I know Sid for one is really excited about uh, continuing working with us and, and what the what the building can hold. So if you have, go ahead. So I'd be really interested in hearing, so I don't know if it's this form to hear that form, but I'd love to hear what staff perception yeah, sure. are. Sure. So that's one request. Yeah. Um, and my other request is I do have feedback. Um, I thought overall that their presentation hit the mark. I, I do think there were a couple spots where I would, um, I don't know if it's that, hmm, uh, that some of our, I, I want knowing our community, I think there are a couple spots that we maybe underestimated some pieces. And specifically things like um, our Pacific Northwest area being about trade and outdoors, and I don't see any mention particularly about like outdoor recreational canoeing, the stuff that we get in the Northwest that maybe they haven't seen running through their park and rec departments as much yeah. um, that they do. So that, that is an example. I also thought there was some underestimating around sports tournaments. Um, again, knowing we know what we attract here, and, and I, I would bet that we're already, just with pickleball, we can probably overachieve yeah. what they're estimating here. So I think there were some places, but I think some other areas that they really hit the nail on the head was around some of the other recreation pieces. Um, I'm also super interested in their projections around um, the stuff that sort of the youth program area um, yeah. stuff because um, I think their expertise there and just super excited about what that will bring to our community. Okay, thank you. But how do you want us to provide you our feedback? Should we schedule time with you? Or yeah, what, what, uh, what? schedule time is great. Or if you want to, I mean, what I've been gathering so far from staff is just kind of a bulleted list. And we we had a long uh, meeting, so they just kind of sort of 
go over the pro forma with them if they haven't gotten familiar with it yet. But um, yes, I'll, I jotted a couple notes down of what you said, but if there's other things, I think electronic is, is great. If you want to schedule a meeting, we can do that. Great. And then if we could set sort of a timeline for having that stuff, that way I can let um, at least Evan and Susie know sort of where we stand. I'd say, can we all agree on like a week? Getting, mm -hmm. getting back to Skyler with any suggestions? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to moving on and, and getting the final report. I, I think they've done a, a really good job. Um, and I, I know that they've been focusing on the SRC building itself, but we need to look at our strategic plan in the context of, yeah. of all our programs and how does Broadway Field work with the SRC in our locker rooms and how do, if we're shifting programs to the SRC, I'd like their input too on how we might be able to utilize the old fitness center, um, the, the youth center, and, and how does that work with the community center? Which yeah. the city owns, of course, sure. but uh, we don't get a lot of revenue, but we have a lot of opportunities to run programs here. So I'd be interested in a little more comprehensive approach, but they have, their contract was to focus on the SRC. Right. But as we move forward, we might want to consider, and I don't know if this is a staff role or what assistance the board members we could play, but I think we should prep for the release of their final report and what kind of yeah. sort of report out to the community that we provide. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about in, of that internally, but I'd love to get support uh, feedback on how to message this, what kind of um, uh, coverage, I guess, uh, or highlighting of it. Other we can do, obviously, it's going to live somewhere where it's, it's visible, but should we do a community webinar like we did before? I think our consultants would actually be happy to participate in that, or it could be led more internally. Um, but yeah, how to, how to kind of message this out. So I think it is really exciting and it shows that we've I think, engaged in a really good process already uh, while uh, running concurrently while we've been using the building. Most of the, a lot of the staff feedback has had to do, I guess, uh, kind of with two areas. One is if you look at that uh, facility map that's in there, kind of the, the overview or the, there's there's some kind of questions about where things were chosen to sit and is that the best spot for them. Uh, one thing that, you know, Levi brought up, a couple of maintenance sort of needs or issues. There's no uh, dedicated loading zone for, for freight. Um, and that's a consideration, especially if we're going to close or eventually close that access road. That's where a lot of the freight had come in previously and could still if it came around the backside, but um, just kind of ironing out some of those some of those details. Uh, there's a spot for, I think there's a spot for um, for drop-in care and there's a spot for, for aftercare or something. It, it's kind of confusing how they worded some of the youth programs opportunities and one of them is not located near the rest of the youth programs. I think it's located kind of in the central part of the building near what used to be the staff break room. Uh, so sort of talking, yeah, yeah, kind of figuring out, making sure that those spots are aligned. Um, and then as far as the numbers, uh, I think the concern would be that some of the figures are perhaps a little too ambitious for what we might be able to pull off right now, given um, uh, the staff to child ratios that we have to keep in youth programs, especially for preschool. And then if we were to add infant care, that ratio even goes down. I think it's like one to either one to four or one to six if we're going to add infants. And so obviously as you had staff and uh, to, to keep up with those the, that age group, then your revenue when your your expenses go up and your revenue goes down. But overall, uh, I think we're also very pleased with it and looking forward to it. One of the things, though, that I was trying to do is crosswalk. I didn't really have enough time. I might, I might want to meet with you on it, but sure. to crosswalk with this, with the, um, what do you call it, the 110% cost recovery. Yes. The cost recovery piece, and I was just noting some of the back and forth, um, and just specifically I was thinking about that chart with the arrow about the most subsidy versus number of people yeah. served kind of piece and thinking about how that incorporates into our space use. Um, 
That's a good point. We talked a little bit about that in staff meeting, and I think one of the things that we thought about was as we look to phase in programs or services in the SRC, maybe we prioritize those services that are going to be that we feel like are closest to our mission alignment, right, and are, are most good for the most amount of people, uh, rather than focusing on the specialized right. programs. But I think your point is yeah. is really good. Well, I think I think one of the other things that's difficult to come up with, and I, I think it has a little bit to do with our financials. Our financials, one of the challenges around our financials is that we have stuff categorized. Some of the stuff listed has to do with facilities. Some of the stuff listed is programming, and some of the stuff is a mix of facility and programming. And so, you know, thinking about how much square footage certain programs are taking up and what real estate they're using, I think it's a consideration into the overall strategy. Yeah. Um, and then thinking about, you know, uh, for the programs that we are subsidizing um, heavily with tax dollars, are those the ones bringing the highest value to the most citizens yeah. or to our highest needs citizens? So, yeah. Yeah. So okay. is it okay for, for me to issue a reminder? If you have feedback, to get it to me in a week, and I'll yeah. work with Susie and let them know they'll yeah. uh, they'll have my full my full report by then. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, new business occupancy process. Yeah. So uh, something I think uh, you asked yeah. for an update on. So it's been something we've again long long process. We've been working on it for just about a year now. Um, we knew uh, when we took ownership of the building that we would have to go through an occupancy process with the city and kind of started working on it uh, early. Uh, with COVID, it was it was different because we weren't really using the building for the first while. We got a temporary occupancy to use the building for youth programs and then um, started working with Open Space Architecture in the spring of last year to uh, have them work help us with uh, getting full occupancy for the building. But because of their uh, work staff had, Work, work shortage issues with internally within their department and other other challenges. They weren't actually able to get out and on site with us until the middle of the summer. It took them about a month to complete the report. They submitted that to uh, us and we shared it with uh, the city who has to work with us on the occupancy. And we've had you know a number of conversations going back and forth and uh, most of them I think have been really productive, especially when we've been able to connect with those the city staff in person. Now at this point we're on a we're on the same page, uh, which unfortunately hasn't been the case the whole time, but is now uh, the situation where we're communicating with them about kind of the schedule at the SRC, what programs and services are using the building, where we're at in the building, and um, in doing so we've kind of decided over the last few weeks to to transfer uh, the the rest of the occupancy process of getting the occupancy to um, SEA the architecture firm that we're working with on the strategic planning process. Uh, so uh, they're they're not starting fresh because uh, we've shared the resources that we have, and obviously they know, they know the building really well, but they do this kind of work often. So they've delivered a scope intent and a scope of work for us, and a fee, uh, uh, an approximate fee that be it'll I think it'll be really close to this. And we're also looped in the clock group to help us in this conversation because it is kind of a it seems to be. Uh, unbeknownst to me before this, it, it, there's a kind of a give and take. There's a there's discussion, there's conversation, and there's sort of a back and forth that exists between the building owner and the city as you work through some of these issues. When the building is, is older and has been grandfathered in, and there's a number of things that maybe aren't ideal, but uh, we can work with the city to sort of identify what needs to be changed and modified and then move forward. So I'm really optimistic. Uh, I think the fee is fair. And um, just bring it to you as an update. If you have questions, happy to happy to hear them. I wasn't here for the first discussion on this, so there's like just a limited amount of people that we can have in the building. Is that the issue? Yeah. So basically, the building doesn't have full occupancy. So all the stuff that we've been doing has been kind of almost grandfathered in, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, as a way of using the the building, making sure that we, you know. We have opportunities to showcase the gyms and have to yeah. get in there and stuff. Uh, still can provide space to our tenants and then using it for youth programs, but that's why we're not able to just leave the building unlocked all the time and let people come in and use the gyms, for example, because we don't have that full occupancy. Um, and some of that has to do with like 
having the fire department come in, and, you know, I, I yeah, it has to do with like exits and yeah. making sure that uh, the building is in compliance with. Um, uh, so, like you, you people, e what's that? Egress, yeah, and yeah, people, make sure that people that are in like a, a wheelchair have access to the building in the right way. So there's some things that the building is deficient in because it was built before certain standards were created, and and it's kind of a navigation process of us figuring out with the city, okay, this is something that you definitely have to change, or this is something that you can still be still be grandfathered in potentially. Mm -hmm. So like the bleachers in the gym one is a great example, right? Because if you built a gym like that now, there's no way that you can have bleachers like that. Um, they're just not, they're not safe, but there's some kind of back and forth and give and take. Some of the things, some of the solutions or um, uh, fixes are really simple. They're, you know, installing an emergency exit sign here, keeping yeah. these doors open, and some of them are a little more complex. And so until that happens, like certain, there's a kind of a limit on like renting that space? Yeah, it's sort of like, uh, yeah. There's okay. a limit, and I think it's also like we have to do our part in communicating with the city. So let's say like we have a, a, a possible rental of the space in March or April, and we're instead of just saying, yeah, we, let's do that, that sounds great, we're going to the city and saying, hey, what are the things that we would need to do to accommodate this rental for you mm -hmm. to feel comfortable? That's kind of where we're at right now with it. Yeah, that's fun. Given the, the certainty, I guess, that eventually we'll get this occupancy permit, uh, hopefully in a useful way. Uh, I remember going into this building and we were advised by our insurers that uh, the building doesn't meet the threshold for a really good policy level, you know, where it's costing us quite a bit because there's uh, a lot of things in the building that appear to be problematic. If, if we get this certificate, will we be able to see reduction in our insurance? I think that's that's a great point. So what um, we'll be doing, and I've talked to our, our risk management folks at Special Districts because they're the ones who made that determination, but we'll be basically sending them all of the things that we've gathered as a result of our due diligence process and then also being in the building for a year. So the structural engineer report, the asbestos report, all those concerns that they had, now we have better information on, full report on, and it's been a full year of us occupying the building. We can share that with them and say, you know, is there a way that we can uh, have this building reassessed uh, yeah. and ensured at a different level? And they may say, absolutely not, uh, because these are the concerns that you need to address. And it might be things like the roof. It might be you know, some of the other concerns that they have. But yeah. uh, I think that's a good point. You know, there, I'm sure there's going to be always some concerns. Do we have um, like a timeline or a deadline or any, are there any milestones we have to meet yeah uh we don't we don't uh it's timely the city would like us to hurry this along as, po as much as possible but they've also been very understanding that a lot of it's you know kind of out of our control we, we can um we can push we can push we can push but none of us are architects or uh, engineers of the level that that we need so our hope is that uh we'll have all the things done that need to be done to get at least of the occupancy that we need to open the building a little bit more by the end of this fiscal year, so the end of June. And I think I think uh, our folks with SEA and Quash Group, that, that's a more than manageable timeline for that issue. Thank you. Yeah. Um, budget committee, there was a document yeah. in our packet. Um, there were something on here that I wanted you to change. Hold on, let me read it. Was there an insert in the, the agenda for the budget committee? Yeah, it's in the, it's in the. Should be right after the back. Yeah, I didn't get that. You can look at mine, I've read it. So do the, for the vacancies, yeah. Do they, uh, okay. could those people okay. apply again? They could, yeah. yeah. We've never uh, turned people off before. Amber, I think Amber has served one and a half terms, probably. I think she came on and oh. did. Uh, just for warning. Okay. The SEPRD boundaries are the same of the PCRD. 
Is that on the, uh, it's on on the, the application. application? Okay. Sounds good. Um, the other thing that we had had previously done was um, just ask for kind of a resume, sure. which you know wasn't a requirement, but just you know mm -hmm. it was. I think last time we went through this process, almost everybody submitted one, and it was really helpful. Okay, so I can add that to the application if you'd like. Uh, I think essentially what I'm looking for in this meeting, if it's possible, is for you to approve of this application form or make edits to it as you see it, as you see fit. And then kind of the timeline would be we'll probably uh, make this opportunity available around the 1st of February or so and leave it open for about a month. And then at some point in March, uh, potentially right before or after the March board meeting, you would interview the candidates or get to know them better, assuming that's something you want to do when you have more than the vacancies. So we have two vacancies. I haven't heard back from Norman, but I have heard from Tracy and Mr. Gazewood that they would both like to continue fulfilling their terms. Tracy and Gazewood? Yes. So, Skylar, do we, <laughs> this probably sounds really weird, but do we actually have like a job description? I mean, uh, I, what I was wondering is like when we're interviewing and shortlisting, we could be like looking at something to make it uh, like an equitable, like, or, to, to make to help with our decision making, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Instead of just like, oh, we feel that this. Like this for sure. Yeah. I don't know. Even though like we a, have one, list, but we uh, have a job description for the board of director position, so I think we could develop one and they could bring it to you for. Or just like even some bullets of like, sure. you know, key competencies we're looking for or something. Okay. Yeah, and I think that because I think that that's a good point, and it might actually help with candidates' expectations about what they are actually coming in to do and what they don't do. Like, and not coming in to do it at all. Okay. Accounting. Okay. Well, and I think exactly, yeah. and the accounting and financial experience is one piece, right? There are also other valuable sure. aspects that maybe we are looking for. Right. Like, yeah. representing the community, like, right. Out in yeah. the community and, uh, yeah. 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 Is there a desire to have that included even on the like, application instructions to have that information be shared? I would say, say yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. I think I don't think it has to be anything huge either, yeah. you know, just something like a paragraph. Yeah, get some bullets of them. So would it budget laws are the problem? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I'd also be interested in knowing where, what, so where McDonald and Gates would, like, where do we, ge geographically, if we sure. wanted to have some. Yeah, I think uh, McDonald. Ms. Tracy yeah. lives near near yeah. you, up, up in the uh, Hillside Loop area, and mm -hmm. then Mr. Gazewood lives in Surf Pines. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, who's the other one? Norman? I think he lives on Seaside, but I don't know where Norman lives. Okay. Seaside. Just to make sure we're sort of yeah. spreading out. That's a good point. So, I, is this the application that's going to go out? This is just a draft of what we've used previously. So, I think. There's already been at least one or a couple of changes to make. <laughs> dates are, don't match. Budget meetings will take place May 2nd and 17th. Oh, it says May 3rd. Well, those are uh, those are those are tentative dates anyway. So this is just a draft. That's the other part of this. Um, is uh, Catherine suggested that it would be more uh, desirable to have the budget committee meetings be on. Not nights when we didn't have board meetings um, because of the length of those those nights. So I think uh, we were trying to like knock it out and not have to come <laughs> home, but it was a marathon. <laughs> oh my god! So I, I, I threw out like you're catering a, a, a tentative timeline <laughs> of, uh, of uh, approving the, the budget committee members at the off April meeting and then having budget committee meetings those first or the the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday of May with the hope. This would be awesome if the board could adopt the budget at the May meeting yeah. and enact the budget resolution. Then we have a whole month to get to the county and make sure everything's. Sometimes we do it a lot closer time on it. It is a little stressful for, well, at least for me and for the finance manager, probably for others too. Yeah, and I think you know Patrick last year had asked for more than one budget committee meeting, and I, I think that was fair, and I think it worked out fine. But definitely yeah. adding three-hour meeting on top of the board meeting was a little, a little much. Yeah, some five-hour days. Yeah. 
There are budget committees uh, in local government, like the Sunset Empire Transit, and even the City of Seaside have done their entire budget process in one one swoop. So um, it's up to you how you want to do it, and I think your point is fine. And that that doesn't have a preference. I mean, obviously, less time is, is sometimes nice, but I also want to do a good job, and I want to be transparent and not look like we're. You know, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think some of that can be accomplished. I mean, I think this is one of the places where the comprehensive strategic plan that Mike talked about is important because to me, having a budget committee that can align, you know, the, the funding is aligning with a more comprehensive and thoughtful strategic plan is is important. Um, and I think a lot of the questions that we were getting, yeah. like why, well, why are you prioritizing here, and why are we doing this here, and I think if we have that strategic plan. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. So maybe that's one of the bulleted uh, key competencies that we're looking for is an understanding of the SRC, or not the, the SEPRD mission and our strategic plan and here's the resources you could look to for that. Yeah, and even being able to develop that narrative that in addition to handing the folks on this committee the numbers, that we're handing a narrative that explains how and why we prioritize yeah, that might want to be a part of the packet that you provide. Okay. I mean, I know you do that nice whole report that went, I believe, yeah. the budget yep. that explains yep. the district and explains yep. all this stuff, but I think the piece that might be, would be a... Uh, but I think in the interview process, having that up front to, to explain, right? Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. yeah. I don't know if it'll be done by then. No, 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 not that. <laughs> so yeah, we can, we can modify uh, last year's <laughs> and include that again as part of the materials. I was just thinking just the understanding that that's part of what we're looking for. Okay. It's yeah. just not necessarily just all the number crunching, but like an understanding of the district. Okay. Yeah, yeah most of the numbers are crunched already. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where the sort of the maybe the gap in understanding is people are coming in to use their budgeting expertise to help put the budget together. Yeah. And staff is doing most of that. So this is actually more fiscal oversight and alignment with the priorities of the district. It's an alignment job um, more than it is um, a budget. Yeah. Like doing the job. Doing the yeah, yeah. doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one one uh, budget committee returning member said I will do it as long as there's no fighting at the meeting. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, with your permission, I will work on this. Do you want to select maybe a, a board member to check over what uh, I create before it gets sent out to the general public, or are you, are you trusting? I nominate Derek on this one. <laughs> I think. I mean, I don't even think I need to look at it. I, I feel like. I just think you're used to looking at JD like a job oh, description and yeah, yeah, make sure that that yeah, part is clear. I'll send you some. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, <laughs> by, uh, maybe that but don't thing. make it, don't, you know, it can be simple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. But I think also then developing some confidence yeah. that whoever the committee is. That's it, it helps, I think it will help us provide. Yeah. 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 Thank you yeah. for putting that together. Um, a special event review and sponsorship proposal. Do we want Melissa to take four, or is Skylar gonna? Uh, well, she can. She she is the one that really put this together. All, all I did was just put this in the memo. But it there's been have your name on it. There, yeah. So there's <laughs> areas, they're mine. But Melissa and and Justin, like he shared in his presentation, have done a really good job over the past year. I think growing our special events as we're able to do in COVID and what we felt like we were kind of lacking maybe a little bit was just a, a cohesive 12 month kind of outlook for, for programs and making sure that our, our events were spaced out enough that's to help Melissa and her resources but also to help as we go out and engage potential sponsors in the community let them know you know this time of year is when this event and, and, and so on and so forth and so Melissa put together you know kind of a an outlook for potential sponsors. I didn't include that potential sponsorship information because I didn't know if any of you had uh, desires to be sponsors, but I wanted to provide it to you and to the public for visibility as far as here's our kind of the next 12 months of, of programs and activities. And as I share in the kind of opening of this, I, I really view our special events as being you know, a gateway into our programs. I think so many of our community that's how they first hear about our programs and services. That's how they get access. To, and hope, we're hopeful 
always that we're providing a great experience for people and that that experience makes them want to uh, you know come use the pool use our youth programs use some of our other services uh, and um, I think it's really important that we have kind of this blended we have a, I think a really great sort of blended approach to special events different kinds of events you know we have runs and uh, physical activities uh, pickleball tournament and stuff, but we also have stuff to celebrate uh, art in our community we're now with uh, a couple of different art art events and activities. So, anyway, it's just a, a good event. Some of those traditional ones that we've always known. So, no, I didn't get to um, talking about you know Celeste's comment earlier about the arrow and the 110 cost recovery. I think you know when you look at these numbers, greater good. You know, where else are we going to reach three to four hundred? 500 participants in one go yep. and you know introduce them to the district um, while you were talking I had a thought about you know being the gateway do we I mean I remember the turkey trot we had a, a canopy and we kind of had some information I know at the farmers market we have some information about the district but do we have sort of like a I'm almost envisioning like panels with like just that we could just yeah a kiosk that's kind of the word that we could bring to each of these that's kind of a standard you know here's the district in all its glory <laughs> no I, uh, I think I know you're talking about like a professional like a sandwich board like a visual a visual thing that people would see that would be present at yeah, yeah, that we could just like bring to each of these things and set up to sure. have flyers and yeah. So it's like in what you have in the lobby right now with whatever those boards are, and you've got stuff sure. tracked up on them. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, but it's but different. Just you know, I don't know something to travel yeah. circus that's show sure. kiosk. I like the kiosk word. Yeah. But when you say kiosk, I think of something electronic like a. But uh, you're not thinking about that. You're I, talking about like a like a, a graphic. See, when I alert, say here, I or, think you know like at uh, uh, you know like the convention center where you, you have like the different kiosks and they have you know come to my booth and oh, buy okay. my service. I think it's some to me it's some brand and identity work. Like I think that this community still calls us the pool and it's just the reality. And I think. Um, we're missing there that like I, I think there are very few people except maybe those that are being directly served that for instance know about all the senior services that they run through Park and Rec or the pottery classes that are at Park and Rec or that like I think people just don't and frankly I'm not sure people recognize that even all these events are put up by Park and Rec. Yeah. I, um, I would agree. So I think part of it is a, a, a brand challenge and particularly with um, the expansion that we'll be doing with the SRC, um, I think that's a really important piece. We need to bring the big banner and just hang it up everywhere. Yeah, well, I, I think the other thing is with the pandemic, the the brochures to the community didn't go out or right. they sent just that one page. Yeah. So there are things that, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Once that returns, oh. You know, I mean, if, if, Yes. If that returns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's that's true. And I, I agree with you. I think our 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 branding or our identity has always been um, a little you know, it's been just been a little disjointed, uh, a little Yeah, I mean I think one thing is is hard. that at Sunset Empire, like I first of all it's confusing, right? Because we've got the Sunset Empire transportation, so that's a little confusing. I think a lot of people think of that. Yeah. And you know, when I tell people about my board position, I usually say I'm on park and rec. Um, and then they know what what we're doing, and um, it's a little bit clearer. Um, so I, yeah, I think there's some disconnect and some opportunity there for growth. But I, I think backing up, one of the things I've had some trouble. And again, Melissa's done just a fantastic job. Like some of these things, and some of the, even some of the communication pieces are done really well. But I think one of the distinctions I have trouble wrapping my head around with um, with our events is it was good to hear that one of the goals of holding these events is to serve as a gateway, and that helps us then know what we need to do well, right? Yeah. Like, in other words, 
if that if we're truly if that's one of our measures of success for the events we're doing is that we are serving as a gateway to other activities, I'd be curious how many like new signups to our list we get at each event, or you know how many if if we're increasing um, participation after each event, so like measuring some of that. Yeah. But is that really our main goal, or are there other goals? Like, is it that we're trying to create like recreational activities for citizens, or is it, because I've had a little trouble distinguishing like, what's the goal of our events that are different than the goal of the events like that City of Seaside does? Yeah. Like how do we decide that it's a park and rec event versus a downtown development district event versus a chamber of commerce event? Like what, how do we know, how do we know it's our event? How would we know it's a good fit? Well, I can speak to that a little mm -hmm. bit. So um, we have a couple of events coming up this spring that I think uh, illustrate that pretty well. So for example, we have our family dance um, that's going to be March 12th. And um, what we've done with that is we've tried to make it more inclusive of a family. It, it used to be the daddy-daughter dance and the mother-son dance. But we've decided to combine those to just because families are, you know, as you define them, they're, they're Quite different, I think, sometimes, and so um, they, they don't necessarily fit that particular model. So we're we're doing something that you know, family as you define it, um, bring a bring a child out to this activity, and uh, it's you know the the admission fee is, is low. We've got some sponsors, and so that's something where we're um, th that would be more of a special event where there is you know potential to recoup the cost um, because there is an admission fee. But there's a lot of things with that to engage them. So there'll be a DJ, um, we're going to use the old gems, we'll have a craft, snacks, that kind of thing. So that's an example of, of an event that might make more revenue um, and wouldn't necessarily be, you know, the introduction to the, the community. But then we've got our egg hunt that, that happens the day before Easter. Um, and so that one is no cost at all um, to the community. Um, we, we fund it solely through sponsors, and so what we do is, you know, we, we buy like these thousands and thousands of eggs with candy in them, and we put them out on the field, have this egg hunt, um, and so it's really kind of a, just an open invitation to the community to say, hey, come on out, here's a positive, healthy activity that, you know, it's a safe activity, um, and, you know, it's something to, you know, keep your kids engaged in, and so that is really like what we mean by a community event. And, and kind of a you know a gate mm -hmm. to our other events. Um, so and that's one where you know everything we do volunteers are so important as well. Yeah. Because it takes a lot of folks to put on both those kinds of events. So um, and I would say that versus, for example, like some of our 5Ks, that appeals to a very specific audience. You know, folks that are into um, that particular form of exercise. But you know, the community. Egg hunt, that's open to like any anybody, anybody who has a kid in their life. Um, so, you know, it's just a little bit different, I think. I, I think one of kind of to answer a little bit of your question from my perspective is that if you look at these lists of events, mm -hmm. they are geared towards our community, where it's like the downtown development is so not necessarily tourists. Right. So right. so they're events to serve are local. I mean, I think that's. I mean, yeah. The, I I know for a fact that Turkey Trot brought in people from around the area, but they were also they were already coming here and they're Turkey Trot. But like, I mean, the rest of these, you know, the farmers market. Yes, that brings you know yeah. people are here, but um, you know, a hunt. Those are going to be for local people. Those, you know, the family dance stuff's going to be local. So that we're. You know, to me, in my mind, it's, it's, yeah. that's where we fill the need. So, so if I said, if I came in and I said, I want you all, like, I have an idea for an event, and I want it to be hosted by by Sons of Empire, how would you know if that's a good fit for Park and Rec to put on or not? Like, do you have a way? I think that's more what I'm looking for. Like, like, how do you know it belongs to Park and Rec versus? Yeah, I think that's yeah. a great question. I think. Uh, what has what has guided those decisions, at least in the past, is their mission alignment, okay. right? And um, opportunity. Like, there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, activities in our community put on by other groups, PBL, you know, chamber, downtown uh, folks, 
Um, there's a bunch of other ones that, that do stuff every week, and there's probably just about something going on, right? Um, so it's kind of figuring, okay, is there is there really a niche in our in our community for this? Or are we replicating what somebody else might do? Mm -hmm. Can we can we really um, justify the investment that we might have to make um, based on X X Y Z criteria? For me, again, like, and I'm, I'm glad that you shared those two events, the family dance and the egg hunt, because to me, uh, the family dance it hasn't been able to begin the SRC yet, but now this is a great opportunity for us to showcase the diverse uses of the SRC. It's not just mm -hmm. a basketball place, you know, or whatever. It has these great gyms, has great cafeteria, great, a great opportunity for space. The egg hunt is the same way. Here's a really nice turf field that can be played on just about every day of the year. Gates are open, you know, come down and check it out. Uh, those types of things. Now, that, that's not applicable for all of the events. Some of them don't work quite as as perfectly, but I think we're, what we're trying to do is kind of look for a blended approach and different things that will appeal to different people. Young families, perhaps some, some of our uh, older adults population, uh, you know, um, active people that yeah. like running, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. I think it's interesting when you said, like, one of the things that you just kind of made me think, I was making a list of some of those things you thought, you know, gateway to our services, mission alignment opportunities that are niche to us and such kind of But also I think it's interesting to think about that it's on our facilities. So that we're introducing people to our yeah. facilities and right. that might guide, like, even just thinking about, like, um, the 100K relay um, and whether or not that should start and end at the facility, right? So that people are at least seeing it, yeah. and, you know, I don't know. I'm just thinking of like, what are our sort of... Yeah, I was going to mention, I, yeah. I feel like, I mean, I think this is a good list. I just feel like this year, maybe, from my perspective, having more things with the SRC would have been... Yeah. So, for example, like, we have a strategy, we have, you know, a, a plan for the SRC coming out. Like, are we aligning the events to that? strategy and uh, plan. Yeah, I don't know if it, a lot of the uh, events are contained in the plan because they haven't, they're not traditionally like just like the plan is just SRC, right? Yeah. I but just think, I think that there's so much possibility yeah. with the, yeah. with the, that plan that maybe, maybe some of these things maybe in the future become sunsetted and there's, sure. you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, or revised. Or revised. Like, I mean, I feel like the pickleball tournament to me really stands out mm -hmm. because it, I think it's something that you could grow pretty significantly and yeah. have multiple events throughout the year. So, yeah, no, that's true. I don't know. Just the alignment with the strategy, that's the part for me yeah. that doesn't fit. But And even the run for change, as you guys are thinking about that, and it sounds like you're already thinking about how to, re like, I'm just thinking, you've got all this space and including this facility, like, you could plan a course, like a whole challenge course that runs around all the facility, you know, that you run through. Um, like, there's no problem with doing something on the beach, but what we're not doing then is introducing people to our facility or seeing what all the spaces that we have to offer, you know, and so I think thinking about whether or not you can get that in. Like, if we had, like, a triathlon and people ran, and then they went to the pool and yeah. swam, yeah. you know, swam 600 yards yeah. and then go and ran 600 yards or something like that. All well, while well, wearing that. Yeah. We, 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 we did have a triathlon <laughs> and uh, it, it sunsetted rather quickly because uh, it did. One, one of the challenges, I think, though, and uh, you probably know this, uh, but um, anytime we do an event, not on exclusively on the district property. We have to uh, ask the city, we have to go through a, an event permit process with yeah. them. And um, as great as as great as great our partners at the city are, there's often a fair amount of reluctance about crossing streets and even even occupying the problem. That's why traditionally our Break the Chain run, which is in, has been in August, they won't let us actually use the problem because they're afraid that um, we'll uh, detract from the environment of tourism by having active runners on the prom at 9 a.m. So we use the beach. So, uh, yeah, there's there's kind of a, that, that's an important consideration, I guess, because anytime we leave site and go off, we have to, there's a there's an amount of 
extra volunteers and, and permitting and approval that we have to get. Yeah, to I think looking at the list that and and all of these, I mean, other than like the chalk art contest and the hundred K relay, these were all kind of been one that you know we've had for a number of years. Um, and I'm super excited about the chalk art contest. Although I'm still lobbying to add a kite festival to that. <laughs> um, but the all of the beach. or down on the beach? No, on the beach. With, with the chalk. Yeah. Well, that's our scene. Why would you not do the chalk art at the SRC? I'm just curious. Like, I, well, I understood well, the point. The class class class. That's the SRC. Huh? Yeah. Um, so for the chalk art contest, we, we helped the class yeah. to learn how to do the chalk art. So we, we definitely use the SRC for that. And we practiced outside on the sidewalks there. And then we, the next day, we took it to the prom. It was part of the prom centennial. Yeah. So, so I understood the prom centennial. I bought off on that. I would just encourage us to think about, like, yeah. there's a lack of parking to go up and see. Um, yeah. Like, you actually have to have found parking someplace and be walking the park in order to see. And whether we actually have one of the most visible properties in the whole city available to us, and whether or not, yeah, whether or not. You I know the library does. Uh, with the team, Team Tuesday, they go out on a little sidewalk and they do uh, each spot as a book cover. They decorate. But um, anyway, what I was yeah. like, all the rest of these, um, other than the runs, they're pretty much all at a, uh, one of our district properties and they're all like external events. The one that I'm a little concerned about um, is the family dance um, and just the fact that it's 300 people indoors currently. Um, yeah. What do we have plans for that currently in March <laughs> during the height of fun COVID time? We we're thinking about it. Yeah. Um, we we definitely want to kind of use the the older gym. We can also move folks into the newer gym as well to kind of spread this out. Um, we are planning on, on using the cafeteria um, for a couple of things. There's um, a craft that the kids can do. Um, we will have a, a structure there and um, and then have some snacks as well. But we can definitely kind of spread throughout the SRC in different ways to kind of spread people out. Um, I mean, the hard part is always weather. Yeah. So in March, you know, it's not always predictable as far as could we, could we do something outside. So um, that's, that's the biggest thing, I think, at this point. But, you know, we did, and this is, you know, before Omicron, but we did successfully have the Fall Fun Fest there. Um, and How people, many people did we have attend that? Um, I think we had, it was definitely over 200. Because okay. um, I was there and it was yeah. spread out. Yeah. I mean, one difference is with that one, it was it was a timeline where people could kind of come and go. Yeah. And so there was there was kind of a flow of traffic that way versus like with the dance, you know, you got a DJ, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, we may have to limit some of the attendance that may be something to consider um, or just kind of spreading folks out just a little bit. Um, um, yeah, something when you're talking and you're planning and stuff, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've all sort of experienced it, but the mask wearing, uh, that's not, yeah. people are getting tired um, <laughs> of doing it and compliance is getting low, um, right. but it's incredibly important and I feel like that is something that we need to get our message out very early that those are going to be required. Yeah. 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 I really do like, Melissa, that having a planned chart of activities and I think for being able to communicate out to the community and having it like this is really nice. It's, it's been really helpful as far as um, we've been able to get some sponsors so far, still working on getting some sponsors and, and kind of in the middle of talks with various folks. Um, but um, so far, the sponsors who have been interested have really liked that, you know, being able to kind of have like a menu yeah. of, of different um, events that they can see the day, they can kind of see the description. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the actual thing that we gave the sponsors, perhaps not, but um, it was in Justin's presentation, but it was about the space. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so basically, it's it's just, you know, kind of a letter inviting them to sponsor and um, giving them a sense of like, you know, giving them the deep, giving them, you know, the both sort of what the average attendance has been and also the potential for growth. And then the description of the various events. Um, and then we have developed some, some levels. We did um, 
we, we have things like that in the past levels, but we really took a hard look at it and, and tried to make it more, um, just tweak it so that it, you know, so that the sponsors are getting some good marketing out of it and, and um, also thinking about, you know, things like for a run, you know, who, who gets to be on the t-shirt, who doesn't, you know, kind of just maybe raising that expectation just a little bit. Um, and then also, you know, for example, for the, like our farmer's market, that's a really good value for sponsors because it's 16 weeks versus like a one-time event. So raising that level just a little bit as well yeah. because it's more exposure. Um, and and also we have a bigger crop there too because, you know, we have music and, and talent that we're wanting to pay. So um, that's definitely one where we're uh, raising the, the bar just a little bit. So, yeah. For the... Um, sponsors that you do get, do we do, I'm, I'm trying to run through, my, but it's been too long since I've seen events, do we do like banners or do, I mean I know the t-shirt. It, it really but depends on the, the level and then the type yeah. of event, but um, so for example, um, our signature sponsor for this upcoming family dance, we've got a couple different things that we're doing, so there'll be a banner at the event, um, and it can, it can be, you know, some businesses already have a banner, they'd like really? to use. Um, so certainly we can kind of tweak that to the sponsor and what their preferences, but um, you know, different ways to thank them through signage, through um, you know, a flyer that folks get when they, they enter. Um, we, similar to like the Fall Fun Fest, you know, we had a trip or feedback for but again inside that there were materials from the sponsors, um, a thank you flyer, you know, materials that maybe they, the sponsors have for their marketing. Um, we also have, you know, radio possibilities where we can talk about that. Um, so, um, for this particular upcoming event with so the Family Dance, our, our signature sponsor is uh, Runkle, Runkle Consulting Group, and so they're, you know, Runkle Consulting Group presents, so they're like the title sponsor, and then Pacific Power has also um, been part of that, so there's a second tier, and so they're on, you know, the um, graphic that we're doing on social media, um, on the website. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways that we can work with, with them. And we, and we get the word out in a lot of ways too. So we have you know, press releases, we have our monthly newsletter, social media, website, um, through our program guide that we've been doing. And we, we took a step back this year because we were kind of rebuilding things from the pandemic where we had kind of had to really pare down. And there was a lot of, we couldn't totally predict right. like, what activities we're gonna have just because of COVID. So we, we, we made a decision to kind of step that back a little bit and go electronic because then it could be a living document that we could update. And it also saved us a bunch of money too on printing and shipping because that's a, a very large expense. Yeah. Um, and so that, that could always be something that we could bring back, but um, it seems like being more light on our feet and able to adapt with COVID was, was maybe a way thing to do. And save money. So. <laughs> yeah, I do worry though because I know a fair amount of our population is not necessarily tech savvy. Um, so having some sort of access to a hard copy is probably yeah. more beneficial to them, but maybe not necessarily doing the mass mailers, but just kind of trying to problem solve yeah. that. And we do have printed copies um, in the Sunset Pool lobby and that we can do on request or, or just have you yeah. know, available for folks. Same with our annual report as well. Um, that's on our website. Um, it's going to be featured in our upcoming newsletter, some on social media, and we've got the printed copies as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. your happy to answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions regarding special events? Moving on. Um, can I just ask what the sponsorship, what the proposal is? It's a sponsorship proposal. It's they revamped the sponsorship levels, but we did not. Oh. So maybe you could email that to us, so we can see it. Sure, would be nice. Um, the March uh, meeting date, Skyler pointed out, lands on uh, spring break, which I don't know about everybody else, but some of us probably won't be around. So we were going to look at. Uh, moving it, we do have a fifth Tuesday in that month. If that works, the twenty minute. Yeah, um, I I just realized I can't be here on the fifteenth of March because that's my cert. So when okay. the fifth 
Tuesday work for you? Yeah, that's the time. But I can't be here for the budget. Well, those are in tentative dates, so uh, we can we can adjust those. So. Okay. Yeah, the 29th would would be fine. But you I have no spring break. I'm not going time. anywhere. <laughs> so. The is fine. Yeah. Let's move. Can you make can someone uh, make a motion? motion? I move that we move the March meeting to March 29th. Second. Thank you, Erica. All in favor, signify aye. Opposed, nay. Erica. Aye. Two. Aye. Plus. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, for the next section, Catherine. Yeah. Just with time. Is a lot of this come over and by email anyway, Tyler? Or yeah, most of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not saying we cut all the short. I'm just saying not, like. I'm not sure. Uh, go fast. Okay. Um. Well, I have one additional thing that's actually not on there that just came to my attention yesterday. So the Oregon Legislative Assembly passed the House Bill 2560, and it's coming around. And it has an impact on our meetings potentially. Um, if you look under the highlighted section, it says that essentially uh, effective January 1st of this year, if in-person oral testimony is allowed, we have to allow uh, the public to submit during the meeting oral testimony by telephone, video, or other electronic or virtual means. Okay. So it's a possible change mm -hmm. in our meeting structure and the way we do meetings because where we have the meeting available for viewing right now via YouTube, we don't necessarily have a way for those folks to interact and offer public comment, which is what this is requesting. So um, we could do this a, a few different ways, but just wanted to bring it to your attention. I think we have some latitude before we have to make the change, um, but uh, something will have to be changed in order for us to be in compliance with this. I know so. like the city of Cannon Beach has been doing this for a while, but maybe reaching out to them to see what system they have in place. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Rusty Barrett is a great contact. And for Rusty that. very well. He has to run it all. Mm -hmm. okay. well, and then, and I'm saying sip and as an event, but that's not on the master list of events. Is that just sort of a planned event? That's to the foundation. Yeah. 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 Have to allow electronic. There's, there's a separate there's a separate bill though that is essentially requiring uh, municipal governments, local governments to provide electronic access to their mm -hmm. So I would anticipate that this is going to be with us for a while, if not forever. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you want me to talk about that's on this list? Um there's one thing that I would like to talk about. Yeah, talk about no, talk about what you need. I would just I would just say we just finished the annual report and Melissa just finished the annual report over the last maybe a couple of days. She's been working on it diligently for a couple of months and I think it's uh, looks really looks really good and it will be shared far and wide, but uh, highlight some of the work that we were able to do over the last year, uh, including one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars grants raised for the SRC, 13,000 plus visitors to the Bob Chisholm, lots of scholarship money, we talked about the meals, it has the numbers of those that we impact with our aquatic programs and our youth programs and then some other highlights. So uh, since she's here, you can thank her directly, but kudos to Melissa and to all of our staff for the hard work that we had during what was a very uh, busy, busy year and uh, a year requiring some adaptability. Only other thing yeah. I want to talk about is just that the SDO conference has changed to a virtual setting. I know Sue and Mike are going to attend, but it's completely virtual now. And unfortunately, we've had a number of contaminations in the Sunset Pool. What are those? What does that stand for? Physical I thought of those. Yeah. Is it, and it's during the open swims, is it? Not always, but a lot of them, yes. Some of them have been during um, uh, when we've had the swim lessons for our elementary, local elementary schools. Okay. Hmm. So uh, it's not really a swim diaper thing, you don't think? 
It's not typically, I know that's the, that's what I would have thought. <laughs> that's what he does. <laughs> it's not infants and toddlers. It's not that age because we host those kids in Kinder Swim and other programs. It's typically the older kids, I would guess, probably age five to eight or nine. And again, I'm not a, not a biologist or a human development <laughs> specialist, but can't, can't exactly pinpoint <laughs> why. Maybe just a general excitement to forget to go, or maybe it's something with not having enough time for your food to settle. I don't know, but it's a, um, it's a challenge, and I just want to provide some visibility, not because it's gross and it's fun to talk about, but because when it happens, our staff goes has to go to some significant lengths to get the pool reopened. There's no old adage that you just fish it out, pour some chlorine in there, and then everything's good to go. It's not the case. And with the one that happened on New Year's Eve, it required a complete draining of the learner pool and splash, oh and a, you know scrubbing of, of all the walls and the, the filtration device and all the other instruments associated. So. Um, Is there so insurance for that? <laughs> I don't think we have that coverage, Mike. Sorry. So I have two two thoughts because I know as a parent, before I bring my kids to the pool, my first thing that I tell them to do is use the restroom. Um, for the school swim lessons, can we maybe just send a gentle reminder to we the do. teachers we that definitely every do. student yes. needs we to use do. the restroom, and then yes. can we put a sign in the locker room that's big and bright that says? Did you go to the restroom before you get in the pool? Sure. Isn't there I mean, something, something there already? There may be. No. I mean, it's, it's just it's general. There was a time uh, before COVID during open swim when we were uh, making all the kids exit the pool every I half hour or so away and go to the bathroom. And that helped a lot. Uh, we haven't really been able to bring back open swim at the, the capacity of the floor. So I think a lot of kids are, are not secure going to the toilet and in public places. Yeah. And there are some people yeah. who will only use their bathroom at home. Well, even if they know they need to go, so I can't go because um, until I get home. <laughs> I think we I should can we put a link to the I got a job like that um, for the huh. budget committee. Okay. In their document. Yeah. Cool. Is that again? A link to this with the application to the budget committee. And it's on the, the, the link currently is on the home page <coughs> with the uh, graphic that is similar to that. And Ashley's little guy makes it perfect. <laughs> he's he's, he's a good model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we kind of went over special events. Uh, anything else we got there real fast nope. or we'll skip the board comment? Board nope. comment, Erica, go. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to help with the Broadway field, and I really appreciate all you've been doing with with that, Skylar. I, I know it's a lot of work, and um, with all of the thanks to the staff. Congrats to Everett. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Two. Let's see. Thirty one. Um, Thirty seconds. <laughs> lots of positive, uh, amazing activities. Congratulations on the one year anniversary for SRC. I'm wondering if that's the name it's going to keep. <laughs> kind of just curious. Um, but just, uh, I know the, as a participant, the pool was down a couple times because of these fecal incidences. And it's really, I'm amazed at the quality of just the professionalism that our staff puts forth, you know, here. And I'm very, you know, I, I continue to be grateful. Uh, I'm glad to be in the pool as much as I can. Glad the hot tub is back open. Uh, because of, there are a lot of people happy about that, and I think I've passed 30 words, so I'll be quiet. But I am, I think it's so, um, I'm just so grateful to be on this board and see the positive things that are coming out of it, and the fact that we're all working together uh, to for, toward a common goal. Positive. Thanks, Sue. Uh, happy 2022, happy new year, board members, and really looking forward to uh, what this new year holds for us, and hopefully, fingers crossed, a post-COVID uh, world. Um, and just would like to express a thank you to Melissa and Chris and Justin for their presentations or their part in the presentations that we had today. I, for one, really enjoy hearing directly from staff and what you're working on. I think it gives us a great look at um, what's going on at uh, 
So put up here. Thank you. Well, that was a good presentation. Um, I don't have too much to add, although if you would like to see the ribbon cutting of an opening of a new park in this county, um, February 1st, they're going to have a ribbon cutting for the Westport Park, um, which has been totally revamped and, and gutted in new docks and fishing holes, new boat ramps, and they're looking for a camp post, and they, they are surprised, the county is surprised, they don't have one application for a camp post out there, but it, it promises to be a very nice park built with uh, many partnerships. Right. Where is this going to be? February 1st. No, I, don't, where? I don't have the time in Westport. Oh, okay. It's about nine miles uh, west of Clatskill. Um, I would just like to thank uh, Justin for his presentation, for Chris for inviting us to participate in the senior meal um, site for Melissa for joining us and answering all our many questions and for Darren for providing all his excellent IT support. <laughs> um, I, I'm really proud of uh, the one year anniversary. I think that's pretty amazing of that monumentous decision <laughs> and forward thinking for our community. Um, I truly look forward to seeing what this property and what this district can grow to be. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, 2022, we're going to hope is just going to be on an upward trend for uh, things for this district. So thank you, everybody. Congratulations to Everett. Um, and meeting adjourned. Thank you, Captain. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Great. Right, good to see everyone.